And now we're here. We are here and we are present and it is, it is official. Hey everyone, beautiful people out there. This is the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I have with me today regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who is a representative to the house from Wyndham County. Hey, Emily. Hi, Olga. And Stephanie Yu, who, if you have listened to the show before, uh, has, I think this is your third appearance, Stephanie. So thank you for wow. always agreeing to come back and talk to us. <laughs> is that a record? I think it might be, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie is a, is a deputy director with the Public Assets Institute, which is based in Montpelier, and does a lot of very deep dives into Vermont's e economy but it's not just about the numbers. It's also about the people who are impacted by the numbers. So Stephanie, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. You know, one thing um, every year, the Public Assets Institute comes out with what they call their state of working Vermont report. And this year, one piece of the report that um, stood out to me and it's something Emily and I have talked about on the show quite often since this pandemic has started, is just comparing the economic impact of the pandemic with the economic impact of the Great Recession and how so many people who were hit very hard economically by the Great Recession were still recovering and then got just absolutely bowled over by the pandemic. And I'm, you know, I know the pandemic has knocked a lot of numbers out of out of whack. But what are themes that you saw going into the pandemic that we want to make sure are not here when the pandemic is over? It's a great question. So some of the big things, and, and I'll just note, I think that's right. We, you know, normally this report is sort of a look back and it's, it's census data from the year before, so for 2019, but because it was just, 2020 was just such an extraordinary year, we did try to get more recent information. But a lot of what we looked at is that recovery period between the Great Recession and the pandemic-driven recession and kind of did try to understand um, where people were and, and how, um, how they were doing. And so I think the, the, the big trends that we noted, you know, so many people hadn't, as you said, many people hadn't recovered from the Great Recession when this pandemic-driven recession took hold. And we see that in a lot of that um, we see in, in income inequality. I mean, again, these were trends that were happening before the Great Recession even, but sort of continued and were exacerbated by the effects of the Great Recession. So, you know, we saw incomes growing at the top and, and pretty flat for everyone else. Uh, we also saw a greater concentration of income in the hands of fewer people. Um, you know, not a lot of progress on poverty and, and wage growth. You know, we did see a little bit of wage growth towards the, toward the end of the recovery um, after the Great Recession. So 2018, 2019, some of that driven by, you know, required increases in the minimum wage, um, but, but low, on the low end of the wage spectrum, they'd really been flat for more than a decade. So, you know, there's, there, we're just seeing a lot of these trends where things weren't great going into this recession. And so we really need to sort of um, change direction um, on the other side of this or before that actually. And, you know, the governor gave his budget response, uh, state of the budget um, speech, you know, last week, I believe. And, you know, one thing he talked about was basically, and these are my words, not his, but basically let's not rock the ship. Like, let's not do anything fancy with our money and make sure that there's not a lot of budget growth, not a lot of tax, you know, new taxes, that type of thing, which in some ways is not new, I would say, for Governor Scott. But how do you feel, Stephanie, you know, from your, your perspective on the Public Assets Institute, is this a time to, you know, play it safe and cautious with our money? Or do we need to really try to make some investments and, and plug some holes. Well, I think Governor Scott had a number of things right. And I would say that, first of all, Governor Scott acknowledged that there were, that, that there were many Vermonters needs going unmet before the pandemic. 
and and he certainly acknowledged that. But I think to put to put that message side by side with this message of, but we've managed to rein in budget growth, maybe doesn't quite make sense for a lot of people. You know, I think I think the way that we should be thinking about this, and I think you know, to the to the governor's credit, he also did he did talk about some of this federal aid money as how can we use it to make long term investments that aren't just one time sort of you know band aids, but could actually have a long term difference. Um, you know, we don't always agree on how you go about that, but I think that's the right idea. But what we, the way we're thinking about, you know, there is a lot of federal aid coming into Vermont as a result of the pandemic, but from our perspective, um, it really buys us breathing room, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it gives us a chance to put in place the structures that we need to make the, to make it permanent that we can take care of each other when, when we need to be taken care of. So, you know, I look at something like universal school meals, for example, which is essentially paid for throughout this pandemic, but how do we make sure that we can make that permanent? And I think the reality is, is that maybe unlike the governor's message where we would differ, is that we would say that Vermont can do it with or without the federal aid, that we have the capacity, we have the ability, and, and we, we should have the commitment to make sure that we're taking care of people's needs, you know, before, during, after this crisis. I think there are some places in the governor's, I think the governor talked a lot about using this one-time money to shore up things. But when you look at the numbers that are proposed, a lot of the money was used to put a Band-Aid on problems that predated the pandemic and are going to exist after the pandemic and just are gonna hide the problem during the pandemic. So there are a lot of um, very sort of slightly boring example, I guess is that there's a bunch of departments in state government that are essentially funded through fees. Mm -hmm. And the governor has been, has not put forward a fee bill in a long time. Usually there's one every two years. And so those departments are running at a deficit and he's using one-time money to fill that hole rather than seeing what needs to change structurally. I don't know if we need to raise the fees. I think the whole idea that we have all of these different funds and all these different departments that are supposed to have a perfect return on investment in the middle of government makes no sense at all. But that's a separate story. And he's putting off that conversation about whether fees are even the right message or if fees need to rise so that using that as a patch. There are other places that we could use this one-time money to really help ease pretty profound transitions. So one of the things that kept us from family medical leave and universal family medical leave insurance was the significant startup costs while the um, ongoing money was coming into, while we were waiting for the sort of ongoing money to come into the fund. This one-time money is a great way to sort of set up a program like that. Um, a lot of the healthcare, if we were gonna move to universal healthcare, the startup costs for that are significant. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we could do that. We also could put in place these programs like school meals that we know we're going to need to increase revenue to cover in the long term, but we could use it as sort of a stepped approach to ease in those revenue, those um, tax increases over time because we have some money to put up to it. So really ease the transition, the changing the student weights we could use this one-time money as a way of easing the transition into that so that towns who are gonna see a big difference could take their time getting to that difference. So there are a lot of structural things that we could do with this. And um, I think he, the only two that I'm aware of that were in the governor's budget are increased investments in BHCB, which is great, um, which means you know building permanent housing for folks that are living in motels um, for the most part and um, investing in infrastructure, which I'm, um, IT infrastructure, which is super unsexy. And I'm so incredibly excited that that is in the budget. We've talked about that so much. You think it's so funny that I even use the word sexy to talk about IT infrastructure. Um, but I think that's a really, you know, the Department of Labor for starters, but childcare financial assistance, IT infrastructure is a mess, the Department of Children and Families, we can't even like get race and gender data out of it because it's DOS based still. So that one's pretty, those are some good long-term investments, I think. Would make a big difference, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I know the Public Assets Institute, Stephanie, has talked about some changes the state could make independent of COVID, such as shifting how it, it raises revenue for education spending. Mm -hmm. um, 
what are some other things that that the state could shift and and probably get some good you know make some good changes with those well so i i think there's a a couple of different things to look at i think what Emily was saying was right in terms of there's a lot of ways to use sort of this in this this current money from the feds to kind of bridge to a more permanent system to be able to do uh, some of these things more so but i think generally the 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 right answer in terms of thinking about revenue is you know that we should always keep working to make the revenue system more progressive and that's part of what this recommendation for income based school taxes that's a big part of what it does you know right now essentially there's a there's a break on the high income end for folks who are paying based on property value and by putting in place an income based system that sort of just keeps everybody on the same playing field uh, so that would make a big difference. But I think generally speaking, I think that was um, sort of a theme of the tax structure commission recommendations that you know, we, we want, we need a progressive system um, that, um, that it's not enough to say that we're not regressive, that we really need to be working toward a more progressive system. And again, when we see this sort of trend of income inequality, it really makes sense from the perspective of going where the money is. I would love um, if you are able to tell us a little bit about this trend for in income inequality in Vermont, because I know it is something that we have been watching on the national stage and has been very core to a lot of conversations, but I'm wondering how it has played out in Vermont and how it's kind of playing out now. So, you know, this is, this is one of those things where, um, we see the same trend in Vermont that we see at, at the national level in terms of a higher concentration of income being in, in the hands of fewer. And specifically sort of over the last 40 years watching basically all of the income growth that we're seeing. So when we sort of look at the whole pot of income, it's getting bigger, but all of that growth is sort of going into the hands of a few, right? So we do see those trends in Vermont. And in fact, what we, um, a study, and it's, it's getting a little dated now, but it was a study probably, 10, 12 years ago by the, by the Boston Fed actually found that inequality is, is increasing faster in Vermont, right? So even though we started from a place that wasn't as unequal as a lot of states, the rate at which we were getting on more unequal was, was faster. But, you know, and one of the, and so if you're, you know, if, if people can, can see the State of Working Vermont report, we do have a, sort of a current chart in there looking at essentially 50% of income in the hands of the top 20% of Vermonters. So that's a Vermont, you know, those are Vermont specific numbers. Um, and again, that's a, that's a shift, right? That, so that's increased by quite a bit over the last 40 years. So, um, you know, so we do see these trends here as well. Thank you. That's Emily, what's your response to, to that? Because, you know, I, we had inequality, especially going into the pandemic, that mirrored the rest of the country, gender, race, you know, low income uh, levels, but that inequality is speeding up in Vermont or moving faster than the rest of the country, you know, that's concerning. That's not yeah. nothing. I mean, and when we talk about, um, We've talked so much about the pandemic and how differently it's impacted different populations, right? And folks who lost their jobs and or had to stay at work under really tough circumstances versus folks who worked from home and with very stable salaried positions that are spending less money and the stock market um, and all of those things that we, the actual experience of the pandemic, the lived experience, not just the bank account experience of the pandemic has been a huge divide and that continues to grow. And as we, one, look at um, what a progressive taxation system looks like, it becomes a very difficult conversation because Vermont's tax system is more progressive than almost anywhere else in the country. But that doesn't mean, um, and I think Deb actually said this last week when we were talking about the tax structure commission, that we have to work harder and harder and harder and get a more and more and more progressive tax system if we are going to close a greater and greater divide. Right. And our reliance on the service industry um, greatly exacerbated by the pandemic income inequality. We have the highest rate of women collecting unemployment right now in the country 
Um, we should not, you know, that it was sort of a statistical blip and people seem very excited on Twitter for a day. And now it seems like no one's talking about it anymore. And that's huge. Like that's yeah. terrifying. And the long-term impacts and we've of women leaving the workforce for even a short period of time, they carry with them into retirement. Yeah. So even if we fix what happened during this epic nine month period tomorrow, it's, we're still gonna be carrying it in like, you know, sacks on our back for decades, unless we are proactively seeking to remedy the problem or repair the problem, which I haven't seen conversations about. And then the last piece of that is we can have that conversation about revenue and taxation, but the conversation about spending and how we're using federal spending and which, which dollars are going to businesses and which dollars are going to individuals and how that those decisions about who is trusted with recovery money does further widen that gap because the decisions about how those dollars are spent are in the hands of fewer and fewer people when all of the money is going to owners rather than workers. So I think there's some really tough decisions ahead if we're going, if we're going to start closing that gap in Vermont. And I would, I would just add, if I could, I mean, I do think one of the conversations and one of the sort of um, public understanding that has come out of the pandemic is just how much it, it costs for a family to live, right? So a lot of that, the sort of the flurry of conversation around the, the supplemental $600 for unemployment. And then what we're really seeing is that that money, people were spending that money on necessities, right? Yeah. Like it was not a luxury. It was, and so what does that say? If, if, if in fact, what they, with that $600, they were getting more than they would get for their job. The problem is not the $600. The problem is the wage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that, that, that this has really called attention to the fact that our idea of what's realistic for people to live on is, is just way off. You know, I, I think that's one piece. I think the other piece is, gets to this, to, to this sort of, this gender imbalance that we're seeing, which is how important caregiving is in our economy and how ignored and invisible, both elder kids, you know, all of it. And the, and the fact is how much work it is, how critical it is, um, and, and how, like I say, how undervalued from the perspective of there's a lot of unpaid caregiving, but also from the perspective of, how, you know, we saw the childcare system. I mean, I mean, we've known that the childcare system financially was, was, was just, it wasn't working, right? The financial structure was just unsustainable, but we really recognize not, not just that it's not fair to the people working in that industry or to the parents, but also, you know, that we really can't function without a solid childcare system. I mean, we see what happens when schools are shut and childcares are shut. Are shut. That's really a, a critical piece of uh, our communities. Well said. Thank you. You know, Emily, uh, as listeners may know, you serve on the Ways and Means Committee for the House. And you talked about how we can better spend the money so that it, it flows to different places. Mm -hmm. Can you share any thoughts on that? Like, I know you don't have complete control, but where would you start if, well, if you could? Yeah, and on the Ways and Means Committee, I have no control over how we spend the money. I just have control over how we collect the money and um, a limited amount of that on that. But I think it's really, um, it's interesting, particularly in this context, where if we look at the conversation around the recent yield bill, where we thought we were going to have a huge deficit, and now we have a pretty significant surplus, and how, um, as Stephanie said, things are so fluid right now, it's really hard to tell what's going to be happening six months from now. Mm -hmm. I really was thrilled by... Um, seeing sort of a public validation of my theory of change that if federal spending, it goes directly to individuals, then that money gets spent and it strengthens the economy and the state for everyone. Like that was really exciting for me. Like check, I was right, everyone loves that. But we don't know how long that's gonna go on. Um, and all of the sort of hope and change build back better that we're all sitting with right now from Biden's election is great um, but I am a little, I'm very nervous about hope still. Um, and I know 
I have colleagues who are nervous about hope. And then I have other colleagues who um, don't want to build back better. They want to build back the way things were before. And so that's like navigating all of that is difficult. But I do think that the most important places for us to both be collecting revenue and to be spending are in places that are at these gaps. So how can we understand who is thriving financially in the pandemic and who isn't? And how can we target taxes to those who are financially thriving and target spending towards those who are not in a way that actually sort of fits in with what's going on. So if we're going to switch to an income-based education tax system, how can we also make sure that we are naming where those high value homes are? So maybe that means adding a, you know, a fee for high value homes, not a tax, but a fee. Um, and is that $500,000? Is that a million? What even is a high value home? Um, which is sort of different from different places in the state. So that's sort of one place that I see that we really need to be pairing places where we're going to be very focused on income to places where we can find, we actually are able to find wealth. Um, really interesting conversations about those who really gain significantly in the stock market um, and how we are pairing ourselves with federal guidelines and sort of detaching ourselves from federal guidelines. I think it's really important that we capture as much as that, that stock market gain as we can into state revenues. But then I um, personally get, um, and then, sorry, the last thing, and I think we talked about this with Deb last week too, is that Vermont's about to have a real, really significant generational shift. Mm -hmm. And as we have that generational shift, how is wealth gonna be passed from one generation to another and what is the tax um, that needs to be returned to the state upon that transfer? Because mm -hmm. it is a real opportunity to name, to see that wealth and to make sure that taxes are collected on it when that's a little more abstract other times. Um, the two forces that I'm really reckoning with are who is moving to the state right now why are they moving to the state right now? And what capacity do they have to contribute to the well being of everyone? Um, and so some of that sort of fee on a high value home makes sense, property transfer taxes make sense. There's a lot about sort of the next wave of Vermont immigration that I think we need to pay attention to. So we're sort of taxing for that future. And then the other thing I'm thinking a lot about, which came up in the Tax Structure Commission, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Stephanie, is there was a lot. There's a lot of conversation about a progressive tax structure that might not be progressive in every single flank, but is overall progressive. And I get really uncomfortable um, with ideas around, we are going to um, tax everyone at a very high level and then somehow return that money to the poor people who need it. And so I'm uncomfortable about that for two reasons. I'm uncomfortable about that from a structural sort of political place where I think it's just really easy to then remove those returned benefits later on when they become expensive. It mm -hmm. rather, because they are not as deeply built into the structure of the system. And so I think that's a tenuous policy situation to put in place. And then the other reason I'm uncomfortable with it is it just like feels gross. It feels classist and, um, unrespectful of the cash flow of people's lives. And it seems to further a story of um, that Governor Scott's language really sticks with about this idea that there are vulnerable Vermonters that need our charity. And then there are working Vermonters who mm -hmm. we should be investing in or protect mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But I, people who are struggling to make ends meet are, I don't like the idea that they're vulnerable and need to be cared for any more than I think that we all need to be cared for and loved and have a government that works for all of us. But I'm, um, I think tax rebates can be really shady, especially when you need to apply for them or they only come once a year or um, I think a lot of the, yeah, I'll stop there. I can give a thousand examples of where it's icky, but. Yeah. I can I respond? Yes, I mean, please, just please. Add to, I guess. Um, I think a couple of things. One, one thing that I would say with the Tax Structure Commission is that you know they're starting they're, they're starting places a system we have now, 
Yeah. And, and which is, which is perfectly reasonable. And that was their charge is to look at where, where do we make changes now? And I think there's a lot of, it's kind of hard to reimagine, you know, a whole revenue system sort of starting from scratch. What would you do? Like, how much does it really matter whether, you know, whether it's in, it's ultimately all income tax, right? You're paying it all out of your income. So, Mm -hmm. so just because you're taxing sort of slightly different streams and getting at it from different angles, what we want to see is a progressive system that doesn't make life worse for um, anybody who's struggling to meet their basic needs. Um, and that also collects enough to meet, you know, to be adequate to the, to the states, to the needs of the whole state. So a couple of things I'll just note sort of as you were talking, Emily, that I, that I thought about, which is one, we've been a proponent of income-based school taxes for a long time. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the main reason for that is, is because the system that we have now is so complicated. And I think as the tax structure commission report showed, it's pretty clear that your pro- the value of your home is not a great, it's not a great proxy for how much income you actually have or your ability to pay, right? At the low income end, many people are underwater, struggling to make those payments and the value of their house may have increased way beyond what, you know, what it was when they paid, when they bought it. And it's just not, and, and they have a huge mortgage and it's not real, it's not a realistic indicator. And at the high end, what they found is that it's such a small piece of mm-hmm. the assets of people that it really is, it's not a good proxy. But, but the other piece of it is because we have this hybrid system now, which I think most people find very complicated, um, and we have a direct democracy process where we go in on town meeting day and vote for our school budgets, that the fact that it's so complicated is really a problem when you're actually, you're, we don't, individual Vermonters do not vote on the state budget. That's the job of the legislature, right? So, so there's not that direct vote where I'm saying that I'm saying to you, I accept this tax change on my school tax bill by my vote on town meeting day. It's a direct, direct democracy process. So from our perspective, it's really critical that people know what they're voting on on that day. Mm-hmm. And so the, the simplest, fairest system is what should be in place for things that, for something where you have that sort of essentially referendum on you know, each year. But we also support a continued property tax, right? On, and I think it gets to what you're talking about, Emily, which is on a high value home, but also sort of a more broad, a state wealth tax. Like, and, and, and again, it is, this is one of those things where the implementation and the infrastructure are complicated because they don't exist. Um, but, but I think there are ways to get at that. And we don't wanna stop taxing the property of the wealthy. I don't think that's the goal. And so, you know, but that money could go into the general fund and, and like you're saying, the property tax transfer tax and sort of some of these other things. And, you know, I think the argument you end up sort of getting hung up on, like you say, what the, where the line is of what's a high value home and what's not a high value home. And, but, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, right? Yeah. There should still be a process by which we do it. And, and I agree with what you're saying about, um, so for example, a sales tax, increasing the sales tax and knowing, already knowing that it's regressive, increasing the sales tax and then having some other way of delivering that money back, it is messy and it is easy to kind of split those. And that's one of the issues with, um, you know, with the way the, the education system works now is when you treat something as a rebate or I'm giving it back to you, mm-hmm. it's sort of the largesse of the state, yes. right? As opposed to a built-in part of the system. And I think what you're saying is that right. That was so much better said than I said it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do, I've thought about this a lot, <laughs> but I do, um, but I also think that what you're saying is right in that we want, we want universal systems because there isn't, the people that are doing well and the people that aren't doing so well right now, they're not always in one group or another. Everybody can sort of move between those groups. There's a lot of movement between those groups, right? And so it's not like you're poor, you're always poor, you're rich, you're always rich. Although, you know, obviously upward mobility has gotten harder in this, in this country, but, but, but the point is, is that we, we want to have systems that anybody can access, right? That you do want anybody to be able to have their basic needs met sort of regardless of what their situation was five years ago or 10 minutes ago, that you want these systems to be seen as universal and to be seen as supporting everybody. And I do think that again, with this pandemic, a lot of people lost their jobs that, um, you know, for whatever reason, 
and mm -hmm. and it wasn't all low wage jobs it was a whole range of just sort of our whole economy kind of having this cosmic shift um so you do you did see people who were relying on services that really hadn't before and you know and i think that was such an incredible and still is an incredible opportunity because there were so many vermonters and so many legislators because of so many vermonters having to access or deciding to access state systems or charitable systems that never had before and understanding how incredibly complex it is to try to get your needs met by those systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Stephanie and Emily. We need to pause there so we can hear from some of our underwriters, but the Montpelier Happy Hour will return in a moment on WBEW 107.7 L. Ready. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. As always, the opinions on this show are those of the hosts and the guests and not the radio station. If you are just joining us, we are talking with Stephanie Yu from the Public Assets Institute in Montpelier. And we were talking a little bit before the break Emily, uh, just about, you know, taxes and how they work out for, for different people. And um, you mentioned, and I'm not going to phrase this correctly, so bear, bear with me, but philosophically, the difference between taxing on, say, income versus taxing on, say, identity. Could you dive into that and pull that apart for us a little? Yeah, we had this really interesting conversation in committee the other day about, um, particular policies that we have in place to hold people harmless from taxes if their income was a one-time blip. Um, and that being sort of like one of the assumptions of a tidy tax structure. And I was so interested in that because it, it sort of points to this idea that we wanna make sure that people's tax burden is tied to their like underlying class structure, their underlying class identity, more than to the actual amount of money that they have available to them to pay with. And it, it was so confusing. Like that year, that person's a rich person. And that next year, that person's a poor person. And why wouldn't they pay more taxes the year that they're a rich person? I was just, it was so interesting to me. Um, yeah. And Could I understand. Oh, sorry, could you give an example of what might be an economic blip or an Yeah, blip? so what I'm not talking about and could be talking about is we often um, talk about sort of the, um, the cliffs when we go between tax brackets. So when someone sort of crosses say the $100,000 threshold and all of a sudden they're paying the same tax as someone and say the $500,000, I'm making up numbers here would pay and how that's so much more of a blow to someone 100,000 than 500,000. That's not what I'm talking about. The, the one-time things are, let's say someone um, has a massive inheritance, for instance, that they're not usually a person who has a you know, million dollars in the bank, but this year they are. So we shouldn't tax them because, on it because next year they won't be a person with a million dollars in the bank. Um, or the sort of example that was used was farms and farm sales, but there's a way to hold farms separate from this for policy reasons, because you want to like preserve your working lands and that whole thing. So it's a little bit of a red herring of an example when you start using farms. In fact, anytime anyone in the legislature uses farms or farmers as an example of anything, you can just scream red herring and go running out of the room and you'll be safe. So that's sort of, those are one of the examples. Are you, I don't know, you happened to, um, when I was a kid, someone, like when I was a baby, someone bought McDonald's stocks for me in the 70s as like a baby. I don't understand what universe my parents were living in where that made sense. But um, McDonald's stocks went up a lot in between like the middle of the 70s. And when someone gave, like when I was sort of given them as my own when I went off to college. And so I sold them because what was I doing with them? And that was sort of like a one-time windfall that I then used for college. Um, so that's an example of just like a one-time blip of income. And Stephanie, you might have much better examples as I babble through this 
Well, I think there's two things that you're sort of getting at there. I think one is how do you get an accurate picture of a person's actual financial condition, right? Is it just income? Is it just property? Is it some combination? How do you put all the pieces together so that you actually know how many people are they taking care of? You know, you, how do you actually put together a full picture so that you can say it's fair to do this? And, and how can we sort of agree on where's the point at which it's fair to say this this family or this person is doing well enough that it's okay to tax them a little bit more. And where is the point below, you know, this is this is why we have something like the basic needs budget, you know, where we're trying to get to that idea of this is actually what it takes to take care of a family. Which again, not tied to our minimum wage laws, but but it but it exists as sort of an exercise in doing that. So I think that's one angle of it. I think the other angle of it is sort of um, you know from the state's perspective then what is the best way to go about um assessing assessing taxes or sort of evaluating where those thresholds should be and how, how what's the fairest approach but i think it you know it's it's a this is part of where because we don't have state level wealth taxes it is hard to get at this question of what is actually a person's financial picture i mean speaking of red herrings i think that's often something that you hear sort of in the in the in the theoretical taxpayer universe there's a theoretical taxpayer who has a $500,000 house but only $20,000 in income in their retiree and that's been one example and then there's also um a theoretical taxpayer who is hiding all their wealth in their house somehow so if you tax income then you're missing all that you know and a lot of it involves a, this sort of wariness about people gaming the system you know and how can you sort of circumvent what's there and you know ultimately i think we try to get as accurate a picture as we can i you know i think that the the number of people in any of these groups is relatively small and that is a pretty marginal thing and i think generally when you raise taxes you get more revenue right it's not that people suddenly leave the state or people are hiding more of their money generally you end up with more money from the state's perspective and that's sort of the goal um but, you know, but these are complicated questions when you start to get into the nitty gritty of what do we think is a reasonable amount of money, you know, who do we think can pay more and who do we think shouldn't be, you know, should be supported more, you know, it, it, it does get to be sort of a hard thing. The, the basic needs budget that we have in Vermont, and there are many different versions of this, but the Vermont specific one, you know, there's some money built in there for insurance and for savings and, you know, it's really about sufficient self-sufficiency more than even basic needs, I would say. So, you know, I think those, and I think that's right, you know, that that's what what, what we should be looking at, but um, but it's not an obvious switch. And, and the only other thing I would say is that, you know, when we sort of talk about those marginal rates on income, uh, you know, we've we've had this position of, of recommending that, um, you know, so the way that an income tax works when we the progressive income tax works that we have in Vermont, right, you're only paying the top rate on those dollars above that threshold, right? So if the if the threshold begins at 400,000, and you make 500,000, you're only paying paying that top rate on $100,000, the first 400,000 is still subject to those lower tax rates, right? So, so, you know, we've also talked about, at what point do you phase those out? You know, at what point do you say, Actually, if you're making $500,000 in income, you don't need any of these other tax rates. You can pay the top marginal rate on all your income. And could we phase those out? That's another way to make the system more progressive. But some of what you're getting to in terms of this one time stuff, um, so the sale of a business or an inheritance or some, some windfall, you know, I think a lot of that capital gains um, sort of mythology about we're, you know, we want people to invest and we want people to stay and we want people, you know, that it's, you know, it's really a sort of a wealth hoarding mechanism more than anything else. And so how, and so getting away from those pieces, I agree with you, if your income jumps up in a year, then you can afford to pay more in that year. And again, your income goes back down the next year, fine. Or maybe it's not your income, but maybe it's sort of your whole wealth picture, right? Um, then it goes back down. You know, it seems pretty straightforward to me. I mean, the one time, if you pay it one time, it's not that you're obligated to pay it into the future. Your taxes are configured anew every year, um, even every quarter for some folks. And so it's, yeah, it's really fascinating to me that people would be so worried about that. The other, the red herring about um, folks with really 
high value homes and low incomes because of trust funds, which is a very Wyndham County red herring. And um, Deb Brighton last week would like sort of named it the best I've heard anyone say. And she was like, those people are already paying on income because of the system we have. So like that problem is already unsolved. Yeah. And, and a lot of times when we talk about people who have high value property or something or have a lot of wealth and, and low incomes in retirement, if we had an income-based system, presumably they had higher incomes over the course of their career and we would have been capturing it over the course of their career, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I think it is a question of, it's also the sort of snapshot of where you are in your life. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how does some of this conversation feed back to um, school taxes and uh, waiting study, the student, waiting study or does it not no it's it's certainly i mean i think it's connected for a couple of reasons um one i would say that one of the challenges that we have around the state budget generally is that we we focus a lot on the money and not on the the people and so we'd like to have that conversation be more about the people and less about the money but but it does come back to tax rates a lot of the time and 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 i think there's two pieces to the waiting study number one the major finding of the rating, waiting study is that we are drastically underestimating the resources necessary to, um, to provide education and resources to kids coming from an economically disadvantaged background. So that's clearly sort of, this is already designed to start to address some, some areas where kids aren't getting the resources that they need. Um, but the, other, but the other side of the conversation, the sort of technical detail side of the conversation, which is the tax rate piece, which is if you change the weights tomorrow, so if you increase the weight for, so, so I don't know how, you know, if people feel like they, they have a good understanding of what the weights do, but essentially it allows you to count a pupil who's coming from an, a dis, an economically disadvantaged background as slightly more than one pupil for the purposes of what you've got, of the resources you've got, right? And what the weighting study found, and there was, there's other weights that we have too, but what the weighting study found is that you actually should count them as way more than that, right? You actually need more resources and you should count them as way more than that. But the way that the system actually works is that if you were to change the weights tomorrow, um, the analysis that has been done has been based on the idea that every town would keep their same spending. So if every town were to keep their same spending, what would happen is that some of the town's tax rates would go down for that same spending and some of the town's tax rates would go up for that same spending. It actually wouldn't guarantee that you're getting resources to those kids. To the kids who need it, which is so, and we've talked about the waiting study on this show a number of times before, including having the author of the study on a year ago. Just about. Okay. And yeah. time is very hard. It was when we were still it was we were still non-video. It was pre-pandemic when we had that conversation. But um, the piece about those assumptions about spending is where I've been thinking about this and talking about this a lot. Because I think it's really interesting that one, we're not guaranteeing that kids who need it are going to get that funding. And two, from what I understand of studies that have been done of this nationally, and it's really hard to use for, use national studies on school spending in Vermont because we do have such a very different structure than anywhere else in the country, um, is that generally higher wealth towns will always continue to spend and to spend and collect more and lower wealth towns will always continue to spend and tax less, even if you, whatever tweaks you put on the system. Um, and so given that we're not talking about changing the ability of individual committee, communities to decide on their budgets, but in fact, just talking about the tax burden on those communities based on their budgets, it seems like we'll still be in a situation where a lot of communities, the kids aren't getting the resources that they need, though the tax burden on those communities might go down. And Brattleboro, I think, is a little bit of a different case than some of those towns in that we tend to have fairly high school budgets and tend to pass our school budgets, at least over the last decade. Um, and we have a, we're, have a very high poverty rate in our schools. 
And so we would do incredibly, both our kids and our tax rates would do very, very well if the weights were implemented. But I don't know if that's necessarily true for most areas of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's really interesting about Brattleboro because I think that is kind of an unusual mix, right? Mm -hmm. um, a willingness to invest and a high concentration of the kids who would need more resources. But, you know, but I do want to just say, we also have another method for getting resources to kids that need them. And one of the ways that we do that is through categorical aid. So yes. weight and categorical aids are the, sort of the two categories of things that the state, where the state is kind of taking the statewide look and saying, we're gonna try and smooth some of these differences between districts. Weights is one way and categorical aid is another, but it's very different in that the state is really just, the ed fund is really just picking up the cost of, of certain services. So transportation, mm -hmm. special ed, and then small schools grant is a little is a little one. Um, so, so there's a real question in terms of, you know, the weights are based on the assumption that for every kid facing these circumstances, you're gonna need more resources. The transportation categorically it is a little different because the assumption is we know exactly how many dollars we spend on transportation, right? And here's our transportation budget. Here's how much the bus cost. We're gonna pick up this cost. Here's the receipt. It's very straightforward. Um, and some of these things are just more complicated where it's not a kid by kid service. It's not an easily definable cost. Mm -hmm. um, and so the answer might be that we that there's some mix of adjusting the weights and adding categorical aid for certain services that we identify as being more necessary for these communities. You know, English language learners are another way that we weight pupils. Mm -hmm. And again, those services might be more definable than some of the other services um, that we provide. So- And I think there are some definable services connected to low-income kids, you know, having school social workers, um, a lot more school social workers and school guidance counselors, one like very clear one. Um, sure. But, you know, but those services all, you know, I think that those are good examples, but they're also, it's not that if you have one more school social worker, that person is only going to see certain kids. It, Absolutely. I mean, maybe, but they may also be available to all the kids. So, you know, it's sort of this messy, and, and there should be some flexibility for the schools to figure out what's best for Absolutely. their community. Yes. You know, we have uh, just about 10 minutes left. I want to segue a little bit to you, to you, Stephanie, to talk about um, our budgeting process as a state. And is it the best process to mm -hmm. really get at the what the needs are? And, and are there things you'd like to see different? So I, I was talking earlier about this fact that we have that our school budgeting process is sort of this direct democracy uh, process. But, but what that means is that we actually decide how much we need and then we set the rates to provide what we need with the school budgets, which is sort of the opposite of how the rest of the state budget works in that for the most part, and, and Emily mentioned fees too, a lot of these things are sort of fixed. We accept the money that we get as a result of that revenue. And then we force the state budget to fit under whatever that revenue cap is, right? And so I don't, I don't know that you could, you know, sort of flip the state budget around to do it that way, but it does feel like there's sort of something to this at least having a better sense of what the needs are, doing a better needs assessment process each year. So for example, we know that the reach up dollars that we provide are not up to the level that they should be, right? They're, they're based on 2014 basic needs now, which was, a, I think, or maybe it's 2016, whatever, which was a step up from the 2008 estimate, but they're still not current, right? Like there's a lot of things that aren't current that we know aren't current. And I'll tell you that in 2005, when I was on reach up, it was, it is nowhere near enough money for anyone to even come close to meeting their basic needs. It is an absurd program in terms of the level of funding compared to the level of need and the theory of change that's built into the program about improving people's lives. It's, it's deliberately leaving people in poverty. Yes. And that is the, the way the program is designed, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I'll tell you, I've worked for a couple of different states and some of them are better than others. And they're all sort of subject to sort of the political process and all that. But, but there is a requirement where I worked in Michigan, there is a requirement that you have to say, here's what I actually need to fully fund this program. And then here's what I have to work with. And here's what I can't do as a result of the number that I have to work with being lower. And, you know, again, 
sometimes there's sort of political smoothing that goes around what of that what a lot of that information is is sort of public or what you say but there is this necessity you're forced to actually say this is what it would take to do the whole thing you know to fully to to do all the things that we'd like to be able to do to not leave people on the wait list to you know and and so there i think there are some tweaks to the process that could be made you know one of the things that we've talked a lot about with the education fund is sort of is is having an independent advisory uh, group do the yield, you know, recommend a yield, as opposed to that going through the legislature and having it be subject to a more political process, sort of like the, the debt, um, the debt, debt affordability committee. committee. Yeah. So, so I think there are some ways to take some of the political aspects out of some of this conversation and sort of have it be more of an automated process that you're actually assessing you know, the things that you're not doing and you're making a choice about those, an informed choice as opposed to, um, and, and that you have sort of a, the goal. Here's the goal of what this program is supposed to be accomplishing. I really appreciate you bringing this up. Um, mm -hmm. One of the, very early on in my time in the legislature there, um, we had a big debate about weatherization funding. And I asked one of the lobbyists walking down the hallway, like I think the day before the vote, hey, how much do we need to actually like weatherize all the houses? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, you don't know? And he's like, no, I can get the number for you. And he like started freaking out. I was like, I'm gonna vote for more weatherization funding. I just wonder if eventually you could tell me the answer to that. Cause he was about to like, he was worried that I, you know needed that number to move forward but I've still never gotten that number. And when I've done my professional work in government accountability is about like, is the theory of change in your program wrong or are you just running your program wrong? Like, why is, why is this not working? And there's two such different reasons it could not be working. And in state government, we so often select a program or a theory of change or an idea, say we're gonna follow through on this and then fund it at sort of a quarter of the level that's required and then say, oh, we must have been wrong. It was a bad idea in the first place, rather than we fail to actually fully provide to do this well enough to, for it to make a difference. And sometimes I think there's motivation to just spread the money around to say you're doing more things, you know, acknowledging that that, but it all does come back to this idea that you're, 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 con you're starting with the money that you have mm -hmm. and not asking the other questions. And my understanding is that we have in statute um, a requirement to build out a needs-based budget. And we just haven't in a long time because my guess is that part of it is that it's a huge amount of effort and people felt like we weren't doing anything with it anyway. So why were we bothering? But it is, I think it's really important for Vermonters to see the places where we are sort of fully funding need and the places where we're skimping so that they can make better decisions. When you first started talking about having, um, when we were on the break and you sort of brought up talking about this, Stephanie, I thought what you were gonna talk about is the public participation process in our budgeting, which it also is very interesting to me, right? You know, we have public hearings scheduled for today, I think actually, um, on the full budget for the year and folks can sign up and testify on Zoom for two or three minutes about what they think the budget for the whole state should look like. And I can't imagine being a member of the appropriations committee and trying to wade through how to put, say those 40 people's testimony in context of the thousands and thousands of Vermonters who never made it to this random Zoom scream to testify. And it's, it's very interesting to me. And that seems to be the only real place that we have to interact with the budget. I think that's a good point. We do require this public participation and there ha and most of the time it's felt a little bit perfunctory, right? Like we've checked that box, but it's not really incorporated. The feedback isn't really incorporated. And to be fair, how well equipped are people to say, I mean, I think when you ask yeah. people, do they value education? They say, yes. Do we think we should spend the money on this? Yes. But then you also ask them the question of, well, do you, do you want your taxes? Which taxes should we raise? And they all say none of them. Yeah. So, you know, it, people are, you know, it's, it is complicated and people don't have to hold these sort of coherent ideas about what should happen. No, we're all just trying to live our lives and like state government's just like a little whisper in the storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
we are unfortunately coming to the end of the second half. Um, so I want to check in with Emily. Do you have a toast for us today? Yeah, before I do my toast, I'm going to pour myself some water. And I am going to thank Stephanie for coming on a third time. I think if you come on five times by the end of this biennium, we'll have a special Montpelier Happy Hour Award. Definitely. Because we do have a few other people who have come on twice and might come on a third time. So I think this might be a really exciting like Friends of Happy Hour thing we could start that I'm naming I right now. Like that. Okay, great. We yes. have a really cute logo that I don't know if you've seen that we've just gotten in the last year. I think it would look really nice on some some swag. So well a, a gold ribbon or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. 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 Um so on that note, I would like to toast to um taxes. May they help us use our collective wisdom to decide on the collective good. Thank you. You're here. Stephanie, thank you again for being on the show. The Public Assets Institute puts out a lot of reports and a lot of really great publications. Where can people find more information if they, they want to dig into some of these numbers? We're everywhere. Publicassets.org has all of it. Facebook, Twitter, any, anywhere. And we're also working on an education funding guide update. So hopefully that'll be out soon and people can look for that. Thank you. Emily, How? where can people find you? Folks can find me at emilykornheiser.org where you can find links to the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or um, join me for a Zoom community conversation every Saturday at 10 a.m. As always, I'm your host, Olga Peters. This is the Montpelier Happy Hour. You can find us at two o'clock on Friday on WVEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 or on our Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page or the Montpelier Happy Hour dot captivate dot FM where you can find past and present episodes. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>